Okay. Um, good evening, all. If you're based in Greenwich time or nearby, um, <laughs> may I start by asking you to mute and turn off your cameras for optimized bandwidth, please? Um, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Sharon Toma this, this evening. Sharon has kindly taken time out of her busy schedule to contribute to our Zoom series um, with a talk uh, titled uh, Public Space and Public Practice, the South African Architectural post operatide uh, In her abstract, and I quote, uh, beginning in the late 19... 90s after apartheid came to an end uh, architects and urban designers uh, in south africa increasingly turned to public space to articulate what they thought should be the architectural backdrop to the country's emerging democracy this talk will discuss some of the key moments uh, in this public space turn uh, focusing on a set of sites in cape town and how they articulated what uh, has been possible and at the stake in creating an architecture concerned with meeting the needs of a previously disadvantaged public. Sharon is an assistant professor in the School of Architecture and Design at Virginia Tech. She received her PhD in, in the history and theory of architecture from the University of California at Berkeley. She also holds an MPhil from the University of Cape Town an MR from uh, the University of Oregon, and her BA from the Washington University in St. Louis. Sharon teaches design studios uh, and the Building Cities course. Her teachings, uh, writings, and presentations address topics including housing, modernism, and urban modern modernity, uh, public space, and architectural activism. She has also taught architectural history theory design and urban studies at other universities in the United States and South Africa. Her extensive body of work sits at the intersection of architectural history and urban studies. Through research that explores how architectural practices operate within and address conditions of urbanized inequality with attention to issues of race, gender, and climate change. She researches and writes essentially about architecture as it addresses and emerges out of instance of urban injustice. Her research investigates sites ranging, ranging from uh, Cape Town in South Africa to the American Appalachia. Her doctoral dissertation, uh, After Modernism, Architectural Articulations of Apartheid End in Cape Town, examines how architects aspirations for political and spatial change were negotiated with state policy and grassroots activism. This research has led to numerous conference presentations and peer-reviewed articles and book chapters and is the subject of a monograph book project. Sharon also practiced architecture for nearly a decade in the San Francisco Bay Area, focusing on community housing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sharon Tamer. To you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Bea, and for inviting me. Um, I'm really excited for our conversation this evening, this afternoon in US time. So as Bea mentioned, what I'm going to be talking about today is the intersection of architecture and everyday lived urban realities. And I'm gonna be doing that by looking um, at urban life in South Africa, particularly in Cape Town, but in a few cities um, after the ending of apartheid. And what I'm gonna be talking about today is how architects and urban designers turn to public space at this moment of the ending of apartheid and how they framed public space as a resource that is something that's fundamental to the city and particularly to the democratic city. So I'm gonna be showing ways that the design of public space has served as a way for architects to think about who are the publics for whom they design and what does it mean for architecture to be a public practice. So as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not South African, um, but I've been coming to Cape Town for quite a long time. And the reason that I've been doing all this work and that I'm so interested in South Africa 
partly comes from my childhood. I was a child of the 1980s, 1970s, and 1980s, and I really grew up seeing anti-apartheid protests on television every night at home in the nightly news. And then as an architecture student in the 1990s, what I started to become aware of is that there was a body of work of architects in South Africa who had been somewhat waiting for apartheid to end, who were very limited in the work that they were willing to take on during apartheid. They wouldn't work for the apartheid state. And so as apartheid came to an end, they started to find opportunities to do design work that really tried to address the social issues that the country was facing. And, you know, as someone who is, you know, maybe a very young hippie um, or very sort of, you know, actively, socially active minded to me, this was really, really exciting and kind of, you know, these imprint of apartheid protests had been burned on my brain as a childhood. And then as I was just coming to the end of architecture school to see this body of work was really inspiring for me. So I started eventually spending time in South Africa. Um, and what I discovered is something that a lot of people talk about, the fact that in South Africa, what you see is a really extreme iteration of conditions that you actually find everywhere. So in this image, what we see is a conglomeration of kind of government built township housing, what you see sort of up here in the upper part of the image, along with sort of radical informality, um, people sort of making do, living in shacks, building, constructing their houses out of anything they can find that fits. And in a way, maybe that's a just more extreme iteration of the homelessness that we see in the US today. So this image from Portland, Oregon, which Portland's considered sort of one of the wealthiest and most stable cities in the US. Um, so in so many ways, the things that you see in South Africa are really extreme iterations of things you see everywhere else from the sort of racial inequalities and the racism of apartheid um, to all sorts of other conditions. So I've been interested in really the ways that architects have tried to address these conditions through their professional practices. And if we think about public space, um, architects have been, the questions about public space are really relevant today. We're in a neoliberal era in which the need to sort of have something that is public, that's fully public and not private, is a really important set of questions. And architects have been designing public spaces for centuries. So obviously spaces for civic exchange, um, spaces for commercial exchange, which go back, you know, this is a Middle Ages image, but we find, you know, spaces for commercial exchange going back centuries and centuries before that, as well as public spaces for power and spectacle. Um, sorry, I keep losing my cursor in this world um, of Zoom. So in South, the South African situation at the end of apartheid was distinctive because what apartheid had done was to create such stark inequities that the public spaces that had been previously built in South African cities could not sort of suddenly become re-inhabited as free, open, democratic spaces. Um, there was a desire to create new spaces for democracy in South Africa, um, but a whole new type of public space needed to be thought of for really a new set of publics. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about tonight is how those things happen. And I'm terribly sorry, I have to admit someone to the room and I can't find my cursor to do that. Sorry, one second. It's really disappearing on me. And there, sorry everyone. Okay. Um, so before I continue, um, what I'm going to do is kind of take um, a little side trip just to define apartheid because I'm guessing that um, some of you who are in this sort of virtual crowd tonight um, were born after apartheid ended and you might only be vaguely familiar with the term and with the history of apartheid. So apartheid literally means apart. It was a policy that was set in place 
1948, you can see that moment on this timeline here, when the National Party elected, was elected in South Africa. But we need to go back a little bit further in this history to sort of understand the context, um, which is in 1652, the Dutch East India Company came to what was then what is kind of the Western Cape region. Um, lots of other uh, countries and colonists had been sort of keeping an eye on the Western Cape as perhaps this, meet, this place where the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean meet each other as a place to maybe set up a refreshment station for all the ships that are passing from Europe across to Asia. Um, and the Dutch East India Company was sort of the, the first to get there and to do it. And what happened when they set up this, what was supposed to be initially just a refreshment station, a place to sort of grow fruits and vegetables and to get fresh water for the ships, set on this whole long course of colonialism. And the very first spatial actions that the Dutch East India Company took really um, were ones that sort of brought them into conflict with the um, indigenous Khoisan people, who we can see in the upper part of this image here. Um, apologize deeply that my cursor has sort of disappeared. Um, so if you look in the upper part of this image, this is the Khoisan people. And so their methods of inhabiting space were much more sort of nomadic than had been previous than the Dutch were um, the kind of Dutch uh, method. And they, um, and these practices of sort of moving around, moving cattle, setting up temporary dwellings were radically sort of interrupted, violently interrupted by the Dutch East India Company. And what you see on the bottom image here is the initial imprint of the town that they set up. And public squares were a significant portion of significant element in this public space. So as you can see in an image like this, this is one of the early squares in Cape Town, is there's a variety of practices going on in public space. Some of those have to do with power and control. Some of those are governing activities. Some are economic activities. Some are um, sorry, the waiting room, my lack of visible cursor. Um, some are economic activities, there's varied racial groups. And so public space in these early centuries was something that was really dynamic and really vibrant. That grew as, oops, as settlement grew by the 19th century, the new neighborhoods that were built in Cape Town in the 19th century, they sort of looked like typical Victorian neighborhoods you might be more used to in some parts of England. They were very much based around the public space of the street. The street was really a place of exchange, of activity. Dwellings were relatively small for many residents of the city. So all life kind of happened in public space. They started to really change in the 20th century for two reasons. Um, part of that is the automobile and the other part of it is government apartheid. So as you can see in a diagram like the one in the lower right, spaces that had been spaces for carriages, spaces for exchange, for markets, suddenly became taken over by the automobile. And we can kind of see in an image like this, this is the foreshore of Cape Town, which is a part of the city that actually had been originally part of the water of the bay. It was filled in, um, which is a practice that happens in cities across the world, um, particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries of sort of filling in water and extending the land of the city. So it's filled in and kind of really remade at the scale of the automobile rather than the scale of the human being, of the pedestrian or the carriage. And so, um, so the scale of the city gets remade. So it's one for cars. 
And at the same time, or sort of in parallel, what happens in 1948 is all of the racial practices which that had been going on in South Africa, particularly under the first the Dutch settlers and then the British, because the British took over the Cape in the early 19th century, all those practices of kind of racial separation and racism really were cemented. And space was used to keep people apart. So at the scale of the nation, what happened was everyone who was considered um, a black person, sort of what they called natives, um, those people, oops, sorry. One second. Oh, now we're really, there we go. Um, were um, sort of forced to stay in what were considered Bantu stands. They were sort of these ethnic homelands. Um, sorry, trying to admit people to the waiting room and I can't see my cursor. There we saw everyone. So people were um, put in ethnic homelands. And um, at the same time, so you were either forced to live outside of the city in these homelands, or you were allowed to be in the city. And, um, Kelly, sorry, it's really, I'm having lots of problems with the computer today. Within cities, what took place was everyone was then assigned to one specific um, space in the city based on your racial identification. So you can see here Cape Town's map and the laws that set these out were called the Group Areas Act. And the Group Areas Act was a really important part of the South African, um, the sort of sets of laws that enforced apartheid. So you can see that there were some areas that were set out for white people, some of them were set out for people of Indian descent, some who are colored, and colored in the South African sort of parlance means mixed race, um, and then people who were black. And so these were all separate areas of the city. And so what this led to were sort of really distinct prohibitions in, in divisions in public space, which we can see really acutely in an image like this. Everything was really separated out. So within the center of the city, any space where there might be mixing taking place was really kind of cordoned off and regulated. And then at the periphery of the city, what you had was sort of really radical poverty and informality because so few resources were put at, devoted to the periphery of the city. So at the end of apartheid in 1994, what you get is um, this sort of exuberance of freedom um, going on. This is 1994 was the moment when South Africa held its first free elections. Um, the African National Congress, which was um, the sort of uh, black majority party, though it is an ethnically racially diverse party, but majority black, um, it was led by Nelson Mandela. The party won the elections and this was the first time that both elections were free and that everyone could participate and that you had a majority elected a majority representative government. So 1994 is this really big moment in South Africa. But what it brought was this tension between the exuberance of freedom and the incredible realities and limitations of poverty and inequality that had been produced over the many, many years of apartheid, as well as all the years of colonialism leading up to apartheid. So um, in Cape Town, what you get is kind of this 
condition at the end of apartheid in 1994 of these really divided worlds. And Cape Town, maybe more than any other South African city, kind of exemplifies the divisions that are so difficult, have been so difficult to overcome after apartheid. Other cities such as Durban and Johannesburg have done a bit better in overcoming them over time. And I really love this image because um, of the detail of what it shows. So what you see here is sort of driving on a bridge overlooking a township space. You see sort of the informality of self-built shacks. Um, you see sort of this artist who um, has sort of the features of a colored man with his art agent. But I, what I want you to look is in the rear view mirror of the vehicle. What you see there is an image of Devil's Peak, which is one of the um, peaks of Table Mountain. And Table Mountain is in some ways the geographic and kind of spiritual heart of Cape Town as a city. But only those who are white and wealthy really have the ability to live around the mountain. If you remember that image I showed you a couple slides ago of the group areas, map. The Table Mountain was sort of in the center of it and was really ringed by white areas. So what you're seeing there is kind of moving away from the white areas and particularly this white art agent that you see in the car kind of traversing the space out to where actually the majority of the city lives, which is out on the townships of the periphery of the city. So this sort of exemplifies what goes on in Cape Town which is these sort of radical inequalities and these kind of movements. Sorry, one second. Now I really. Um, these movements of trying to sort of, of those people who live and practice in the center of the city, which is really the architects, trying to kind of cross the city to actually where the majority is to try to understand the lived realities that are different than theirs as they try to sort of serve the publics of the city. So what's been going on in South Africa since the end of apartheid is architects, or at least sort of a certain body of architects, what Hannah LaRue in this quote calls exemplary architectural practices, um, working to recognize sort of their users in a way that was unprecedented during apartheid, trying to find a new way of operating as an architect to sort of understand, live realities and to design an architecture that has the ability to really meet all of the needs of the majority of the country. And by needs, what I'm talking about are things that are you know, very material, the needs for housing, the needs for economic opportunity, but also needs that have to do a lot with identity and memory. This is why I'm showing this project, the Nelson Mandela Memorial, um, which is a really interesting project. The Nelson Mandela Memorial is actually um, set up on three sites across this one region of the Eastern Cape um, one site is in a city and it's actually an old colonial building that houses all of the gifts that Nelson Mandela ever received as a dignitary. Um, it's kind of this museum of sort of curiosities. Um, a second one is a sort of conference center set up in the town that he lived in as an adult. And then this pavilion, which is in the location at the edge of the village where he was born. And this is really remote, sort of way, way out there um, place. And so it's this idea that you can't embody a man and his life and the sort of struggle that he stood for in one, one place, but it actually, you need to address this history in a broader way across a range of sites and through a range of different types of architecture. So, um, this is sort of that view that you get over the valley where he was born. It's a really amazing place of sort of contemplation of kind of the landscape and the land and the history of the land and all the different meanings of the history of the land. So this takes me to Cape Town um, and to public space design as a method of addressing realities. And I'm gonna be talking about this project for a little while now, the Philippi Public Transit Interchange. Because I think this project 
kind of addresses a whole number of realities and a number of the challenges that architects have been struggling with. So the project, as you can see here, it is, um, I wish that, oh, my cursor has come back, wonderful. Okay, so the project is this space right here. It's the forecourt in front of this train station. So those train lines obviously are here. Here's the old sort of kind of apartheid era train station building. And what you can see out here is part of the um, sort of the township of Philippi, which is a range of houses that were kind of built formally by the apartheid government or afterwards very minimal, modest um, structures, as well as kind of informal buildings built in between, um, range of different housing types. This is the site as the architects first encountered it um, when they were introduced to the project. So this is um, the station back here, and this is where the train lines are over here. And so there were already a range of traders on the site practicing, sort of selling goods out of these kind of these structures that they had built themselves. The architects had been asked to design a sort of forecourt, basically a kind of landscaped space in front of the station. And when they started to investigate the project, they said, wait, there's actually a lot happening, a lot more than just landscaping happening on the site. And why don't we try to actually create an architecture that supports that? Um, and so this is what they started to, this is what they started to create. We're buildings for people to work out of, to sell and trade out of, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes a place for different types of vehicles to meet. This station, this space was intended to be what's called a transit interchange, um, which those of you in England, maybe that's a more common term there. And I think you use public transportation much more than we do here in the US, particularly in rural Southwest Virginia. Um, but a transit interchange is a space where people can move from one type of public transportation to another. So the, this is a train station. Um, the idea was that the informal taxi system, which is really, really vibrant in South Africa, it's a sort of residue from apartheid days when um, people who are not white were not allowed to take formal public transportation, these kind of informal taxi systems, minibus taxis grew up. So the intention with this covered space was a place for the minibus taxis to come in and pull up um, get passengers and then sort of go on their way. The, that part of the station's never, this forecourt has never quite worked out, but that was sort of the intention of it. And what this project was, was part of, um, it was one of the first instances in this program called the Dignified Places Program. And the intent, the Dignified Places Program was sort of this brainchild of some urban designers who had been educated um, in the latter days of apartheid and really educated in this idea that architects and urban designers jobs was to sort of contest the spatiality of modernism and of apartheid. Um, the, the city that had been created under those paradigms was one that was really divided, really spread out, overly reliant on the automobile. There was a lack of space that was scaled for people, for humans. Um, there was way too much dominance by the automobile, which is, you know, ecologically not good. It's not good for a sense of human connection. It's economically actually not even viable for the majority of South African urban residents. And so there's this sort of whole kind of generation of urban designers educated in this way. And when apartheid ends, they suddenly have an opportunity to actually kind of put into action their beliefs. And so a couple of urban designers get hired by the city of Cape Town. They sort of start what had never even been a formal urban design branch and start this program called the Dignified Places Program. And the idea of the Dignified Places Program was to take some of the worst spots in Cape Town, spaces that sort of look like this kind of leftover residu residual spaces, which really were the closest thing to public space in the apartheid city and to transform them into sort of quality spaces for residents. And one of the things that's really most distinctive about the program that might seem just sort of dumb and obvious, 
was that they created spaces that accommodated and kind of encouraged the type of everyday lived realities that actually were taking place on the ground. At the Philippi Public Transit Interchange, what these were were informal trading. People working not, you know, in sort of formal jobs for, you know, set employers, but kind of making things, selling things, um, kind of informal traders. So in this particular image, and this image, what we see are meat sellers, um, people who grill meat in public space and then sell the meat to people who are passing by. And this is a practice that has a long cultural history in South Africa. Um, and it's a very vibrant type of activity to have in a public space. So the Philippi Public Chance Interchange is specifically designed with spaces that accommodate this sort of grilling and selling um, cooking of meat. Um, as well as the space sort of allows these kind of um, individual um, shops to continue um, to be used. So these existing informal practices also were allowed to exist on the site. Um, apologies, my cursor has disappeared again, and so I'm trying to admit someone to the waiting room while I can't see my cursor. So fearful, I'm going to just like end our call. Okay, I think I've left them in. Um, so the space is, as I was saying, the space was designed for um, for both formal buildings as well as informal structures to coexist in the same space. Um, there was sort of these kit of parts of materials used to design the space. There are kind of low walls and benches, which you can see over on the right, um, these people sitting at. Those are um, intention creating places of congregation for people, um, as well as spaces for selling goods. Sometimes these low walls were used to display goods that you could sell out of. Another part of the kit were these shop spaces that were set up. So these were um, all of the buildings. So there's the two buildings that have the spaces for cooking meat and then another building um, or two buildings that are set up with these small bays for people to operate out of to sell um, goods of any type. So there's the herbal shop. But the way that these bays were designed is if your business is successful, you can actually rent multiple bays um, and produce a much larger space. So this um, fish and chips restaurant that you see on the right, as long as I've been coming to this space, which is off and on since 2004, um, this fish and chips business has been there and I think it has about three bays worth of space. It's a really successful space. And these training bays are also set up with this wall at the front, this sort of facial wall, um, which is there um, in part to allow um, the users of the space, the renters, the vendors, to take the space and paint it. Um, so it was a really inexpensive way of adding color to the space and adding some sort of elements of design um, that could be then customized by the inhabitants of the space. And this kind of practice of sort of very flamboyant signage, a very graphic signage, is something that's vernacular to the space, to the practices of, of, of informal traders. What's also interesting about this sort of layout is the way the spaces were designed is you have this bay for trading. And what you can see above the trading space is this kind of slightly sloped sort of loft space up above it. And the intention with the loft space was that it could be used either for storing goods or it could even be a space for someone to sleep um, because the architects were really recognizing what was the lived reality or what is very much the lived reality of the space 
which is that life is really difficult for many people that live on the periphery of Cape Town, which this area of Philippi is very much the periphery of Cape Town. Um, yet, you know, people are really living on the edge in an economic way and may not have money for housing. So if the space that they rent to sell goods out of could also be a space to sleep in, that could be useful. Um, Nolene Murray, who's a South African architectural scholar, sort of calls this an architecture of liberalism in that it's an idea that architects have, um, whether or not anything actually gets practiced in that way is a sort of secondary question, but it's at least trying to think about what the liberalities, lived realities are that architects could be addressing. Um, this space is also kind of designed with these very sort of tectonic elements. You see here the sort of metal pieces, the wooden uh, materials, because something that's also going on in this architecture that you're probably reading is it's tough, it's brutal. Um, in some ways, it's very, very modest. It's you know, built of the most kind of rugged, inexpensive materials, in this case, concrete blocks. Um, and then you use a little bit of lighter weight, more delicate materials sort of up above where maybe it's not going to take so much abuse um, and to kind of provide a more human scale um, and a more sort of human touch to the space. And then just simple materials like paint get used quite extensively. And this idea of kind of using these lighter weight materials and the way that they get assembled, you see, um, unfortunately the cursor has disappeared again, so I can't show you what I mean. But you see where these two beams are coming out and they're kind of sandwiched and holding another piece. This is um, a very kind of indigenous, um, European indigenous uh, South African architectural practice um, of sort of taking two elements and using them to hold another one. Um, Rulof Etenbelhart, who is this the architect of this, the Halpe Library, is one of the considered was considered one of the great architects of the late 20th and early 21st centuries in Cape Town. He's sort of the godfather of architects in Cape Town, at least for sort of white kind of European educated architects. Um, a colleague of mine, Nick Kutzer, calls this the Cape Column, this way of holding up the building, and that gets used at Philippi. So it's sort of working with kind of the local conditions at a variety of modalities. Um, so you sort of see that here. And also what you see in kind of these rugged materials um, that are being used in kind of really intentional ways so that with this assumption that the building's gonna take an awful lot of abuse is something that I've come to calling an austerity architecture, an architecture that just assumes that there's gonna be very little money available for construction and even less money for maintenance over time. And that these buildings are going to take, have a really rough life. So how do you design an architecture that um, has some sense of generosity, some nice sense of play and materiality that can still take this sort of abuse? So this is another project in, Philippi, this is a, sep a separate part of Philippi called Philippi East, um, this Philippi, the Philippi East Sports Facility and School. And so it's designed with these really tough materials, but then with these generous spaces, like this foyer and this ramp, and the idea of the ramp was really to create this gentle space that overlooks onto the main circulation and gathering spaces and becomes almost a sort of performative space. The architects imagine this kind of life and the performance of the students in the space um, and sort of bringing the space alive uh, with humanity. And then the last part of the project that I want to show you in Philippi is the second part of the station, which is the Skywalk Bridge. This is actually a bridge that goes over all of the train lines. And part of this project actually predates the um, public transit interchange. And this is also a project that sort of works within um, these limits um, of what is possible from an economic perspective and how can the architecture really address and kind of enhance public and economic experiences. So the 
architectural language of the Skywalk Bridge is this really sort of tough, robust concrete frame within these lighter weight, predominantly metal materials sort of clipped onto it. So you see here the security station that's clipped onto it. And here you have these rows of shops that are literally sort of clipped on to this concrete bridge. And just like the shops that I was showing you at the transit interchange, these are also very small shops. But if you're successful, you can rent sort of more and more and more. And you can see an entrepreneur's business kind of growing and the space can actually grow um, with them. And I'd like to stop sort of um, looking at Philippi with this view um, to the distance to Table Mountain. Because this sort of reminds us of kind of the distant place that this sort of periphery of the city is to that space of wealth and privilege that surrounds the center of um, the city, which is, you know, the area surrounding Table Mountain. And you can see this view of Devil's Peak, which is the peak on the right of this image is the one that was in the rear view mirror of the painting that I showed you. So it's this city and kind of this space of aspirations that are sort of further away. Sorry, lack of cursor. Trying to get to 40. There we go, for my image. So I wanna show you one more project in Cape Town or set of projects really rather quickly. Um, and I want to kind of return this um, as we think about kind of this disparity between wealth and poverty and return this to this image that I showed you earlier um, or the space I showed you earlier of these shacks um, very precariously sitting on the hillside. Those shacks are at the edge of this new neighborhood center that was just opened a few years ago that's part of an initiative called um, VPUU, Violence Prevention Through Urban Upgrading. And what this particular um, neighborhood center tries to create is just a really simple, modest place for the neighborhood to gather. Um, these photos I took on the opening day. I was lucky enough to be in Cape Town one time um, when this project was opening and was brought along by a colleague who works for VPUU. Um, so you see people gathering. There's a place for kids to have sports. There's very modest little features like these sort of brick walls, which at the rear, you can see they're sort of staggered up the hillside just a little bit. They work as a retaining wall. And you can imagine when it rains, you know, how this sort of sandy um, hillside starts to erode away. So they work as a retaining wall, but they also provide an amphitheater, a place to sort of look on to whatever kind of spectacle and sport is happening in this space. And then a really simple, robust um, structure, this neighborhood center that provides um, services for the people that live in the neighborhood, very types of job resources, food resources, all sorts of things. The VPUU, Violence Prevention Through Upgrading, is a really interesting program. Um, the Dignified Places program that I was showing you earlier with the Philippi Public Transit Interchange, Dignified Places program sort of ran, kind of ran its course by maybe about 2010, in part because money was never devoted to maintaining the spaces. The urban designers were really crafty and um, resourceful and sort of grabbing funds from different places to build these spaces, but they never were able to find the space, the money to maintain them over time. And so the program started to be considered a bit of a failure and kind of wound down. And VPUU potentially, you can argue, stepped in. It's a partnership between the German Development Bank, um, the city of Cape Town, and local communities. And it has two really interesting um, ideas. One of them is that all work is done in collaboration with communities. VPU comes into communities that ask it to come in and really help it deal with violence prevention through looking very holistically at all sorts of social infrastructure in the community. What is going on and how do we address that? And one of the areas that they address it, the sort of second aspect that's really interesting to us as architects, is that they identified urban space as a really key method of addressing violence. So this particular space, which is in the Harari neighborhood of Kailicha, is a whole set of public spaces they create a safe space, a safe mechanism for people to walk from, let's say, the train station to their homes or their train stations to another part of the neighborhood and to feel safe. 
So as you can see, it's a sort of manicured public space. It's well lit. Um, and what you see and the kind of far left of it is this red building, which is called a light box. And there are these series of light boxes sort of scattered through neighborhoods the VPUU has worked in. And the idea is that they act as both sort of surveillance. There's actually security people in the building watching what's going on. So if someone is potentially going to be mugged or some sort of other violence is going to take place, there's someone actually watching that, watching over it, as well as they sort of provide a kind of beacon of light, both literally a beacon of light, like they are glass and they sort of are lit up at night, but also there's all sorts of community resources happening in the building. So they're a beacon in a metaphorical sense as well. Um, and these projects, as I was saying, are very collaboratively made. So they're the community is not just consulted, but sort of takes ownership over the process and the product. And you can see these nice things like these mosaics. Um, attached to this one, is a set of spaces that were um, donated by FIFA, the football organization, when South Africa hosted the World Cup in 2010. So right across from that light box is this space called a Football for Hope Center. And similar to what I was talking about before with what I called sort of austere architecture, these are really simple, robust buildings where architects are working to try to find kind of very affordable and accessible means of creating space that kind of shelters people, that provides a sort of sense of publicness while also sort of providing security and a building that's robust to kind of stand up to abuse. So here you see kind of these um, vernacular small tree um, branches being used to create shadow and dappling of light. You see the tile mosaics, you see the Again, this sort of cape column um, that provides a little bit more delicacy to the architecture. And then just a lot of paint put onto concrete block walls. And um, this is a library that is further up in the space. Uh, this is a space where people, this is actually quite a bit older. This is part of the, um, it says VPU, but this building was actually designed at the same time as the, um, Dignified Places program. It's a place where people can go. There's a post office, a place where they can go and pay for their utilities. Um, now that's probably done much more kind of remotely over phones, but in the 1990s, that was certainly not the case. Oops, wrong direction. And the Cape Town part of the lecture, I just want to end here with this view onto the neighborhood and um, thinking about how these architectures are trying to really con consciously situate themselves in the existing fabric. So there's an existing built fabric that they are trying to situate themselves in and try to sort of upgrade and improve the space. Um, and as well as trying to find a way for architecture to sort of reframe and enhance the spatiality and the lived realities of these places that were so severely marginalized during apartheid. So in the last part of the lecture, I'm gonna um, try to wrap up fairly quickly. I just wanna quickly do a flyby of um, one project in Durban and one project in Johannesburg, um, which kind of reinforce what I'm talking about, but also sort of add another layer of complexity to this story about sort of, excuse me, what is public practice and what is the nature of public space in South Africa? So, so the South African post-apartheid. So in um, Durban, uh, this is Warwick Junction. Um, this is another space that's really been designed intentionally for informal traders. And something I probably should have mentioned earlier is this idea of informal trading, informal economic activity, there's two crucial aspects of it. One of them is under apartheid, there was this absolutely not allowed um, by the government. They would not sanction informal activities at all. So the idea of creating a space that is just for informal traders in the South African context is really, really radical. The um, second important thing I should have mentioned earlier is that um, the South African economy since the sort of late 1980s 
has been of such a sort of structure in which there are just not nearly enough formal jobs for all the adults in South Africa. So formal unemployment is really, really high, well over 25%. So for a large number of people, the only possibility for any kind of employment, any kind of economic activity is to participate in the informal economy, sort of buying, selling, trading, making goods informally. So Warwick Junction is in part a junction of all of these different types of transportation, as you can see here, the rail, um, cars, different freeways, different street scales, but it's also a junction of a whole lot of different traders. You can see here, there's the herbs market, there's the Brook Street market, um, the fruit and vegetable markets, the bovine head market, and that is literally cow head. That's what I was talking about with the meat sellers earlier. So all these different market spaces were kind of woven in um, in an architecturally sort of very elegant way to the infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure of the, ra the railway lines and the freeways and the streets and the pedestrians. So you get this architecture that's really intentionally for the informal traders. And similar to the projects I've been showing, it's in some ways a sort of very robust, simple architecture that's really um, deliberately for the human scale and there to support the traders in the way that they need in order to conduct their activities. Um, in 2014, Durban um, hosted the UIA um, meeting, which is the International Union of Architects. They meet every three years in a different city somewhere around the world. And Durban really treated this meeting as almost kind of like this global sort of city spectacle. They did all these, inter sort of performed all these interventions across the city to sort of put their city on display for all the architects who would be coming from all over the world. And so Faith 47, who's a really amazing mural artist in South Africa, put, um, painted these set of murals on the um, supports for the overpass at Warwick Junction. So we see this one here. Um, here we see it after um, more of them have been complete. And so in one sense, this is the city sort of putting on this display of its intervention in Warwick Junction, that the fact that it sort of embraced the informal traders, created a space for them, created an architecture for them. But there's a little bit in here that we kind of need to more critically unpack. One of them is kind of this celebration of informality. On the one hand, it's really great that the city creates a space for informality and supports it. But when putting it on display, one needs to be really careful overly glamorize informality. It's a never sort of a way of life that is a choice. Um, and it's really a tough way of making life. It's sort of a way of making do. Um, and so it's interesting that Faith 47 sort of concentrates in these murals on the people. Um, Abdul Malik Simon, who's a really significant scholar of the urbanism of the global South, talks about people as infrastructure that for so many people living in cities in Africa and Indonesia and other places with really tough realities, the only infrastructure that people can rely on is themselves and their social networks. That that's where actually people are supported. They're not supported by governments um, and housing and other types of infrastructure, but by themselves. And what Simone also talks about is kind of community, he specifically talks about community arts programs like this, which he says often have kind of the converse effect um, that the sort of state and civil society initiatives want to have, which is that they highlight the failures of groups. They sort of highlight the poverty um, and kind of the failure of people to secure themselves within, within any sort of durable content. So these projects sometimes sort of misidentify the community that is at play in the struggles for survivals. So what I want to sort of say here is that these public practices, design practices, need to be understood as struggles in a variety of ways. So they're the struggle of the residents, the people who are inhabiting these spaces, 
But there's also a real struggle of those who sort of come from outside, whether that's government or architects or planners, to really try to understand adequately um, the residents' needs and struggles and how to identify those. So the projects I've been showing you are ones that try um, and you know a whole nother conversation that we're not having and I'm probably not the expert to have is how successful are they actually at doing that. So to kind of leave us with that point, I wanna to talk about very briefly one last project, which is um, this sculpture that you see kind of in the um, upper right part of this image, Firewalker, which is by William Kentridge and um, Gerhard Marx in Johannesburg. And I just wanna give credit, um, all of my analysis of Firewalker is borrowing from Mpoet Matsipa, who's a South African scholar. So Firewalker is this sculpture um, that tries to sort of address some of the urban conditions in South African cities. The Firewalker sculpture is um, literally sort of um, a um, celebration of people and particularly women. Women are predominantly firewalkers. These women who build up fires, um, coals inside these metal containers every morning and then go around the city carrying these on their head and cooking food on street corners, which they then sell to people. And this figure of the fire walker has traditionally been a sort of um, hallmark feature in urban spaces in South African cities. But what's ironic is as cities like Johannesburg are getting sort of increasingly globalized and developed and kind of infused with capital from spaces on the outside, the firewalker is actually being pushed out of the space. So the firewalker sculpture is this really interesting piece of art. It's sort of all of these sort of fragments. When you see it from a distance, it looks like almost a sort of billboard. But as you get close to it, you see it's all these fragmentary pieces that are coming together. And they actually sort of imagine the firewalker as this figure that is literally sort of falling apart and breaking away. Um, this way of making art is actually um, a practice that um, William Kentridge particip um, uses quite a lot in his work. And if you don't know his work, I highly encourage you to look at it. It's really beautiful and you can find amazing videos of him doing his art. He has really interesting um, art practices and processes. So on one hand, this is sort of, you know, just a process that Kentridge uses and now he's sort of blowing it up and kind of fixing it in time at the scale of a sculpture for the city. But there is a contradiction going on here. This sculpture is placed in a space in a new freeway overpass that's kind of leading people into this kind of revitalized part of Johannesburg, this part of the city that economically had been quite sort of marginalized, had been kind of vacated by businesses and by white residents um, and now all those businesses and residents are sort of moving back into the city and the firewalker is there to sort of acknowledge the resident of the city. But this is actually a resident of the city who's being pushed out exactly at the moment that the sculpture is being put there to celebrate her. So I'm ending on this slide um, and kind of with this question of the, you know, how, how can architecture, how can our formal processes sort of really work um, to try to address the kind of lived realities of cities um, and the actual publics for which we're designing. And I will stop there. Um, and if I can find, I may have to stop sharing so I can find my cursor and B, give the um, hosting capabilities back to you. Thank you, everyone. Sharon, uh, thank you so much um, for such a provocative and inspiring uh, a lecture. Um, before I ask anything, I, I, I want to open to, to the students, um, um, particularly to, to my group, uh, which I think they might find uh, uh, interesting connections with um, the site, are you giving me all the powers back I'm again? I'm trying to. 
<laughs> I think I have them back. Okay, there you go. I'm not sure. You should be the host now? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, I am. Thank you for giving my privilege back, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> which is a word, tricky word with, in the context of, our, of, of, your, of your lecture. Um, um, so so uh, I, I would like to, to um, really open to discussion and, and possible uh, um, cross-reference with uh, our own site here in, in Birmingham, uh, or should I say in, up in Birmingham since I'm in London, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, which I, I, I thought it was, it was extremely interesting and, and pertinent um and then I, I i do have some questions but i would like to to um open to to the students i can see i need to put my specs on um that there's some uh, movement on the chat box um anani says really enjoyed the lecture it beautifully depicts problem of colonial Colonialism uh, and capitalism. Ananya, would you would you like to to extend uh, uh, on your notes? Um, hi, I just just really enjoyed the lecture. It beautifully brings together what past had to offer and what the future is offering currently. So yeah. No, I mean, I think that's, yeah, it's such a good point about the past and the future. So I think, you know, I've, it's always for me funny to put together these lectures because um, particularly as someone who teaches studio, um, but works as a historian, I get very self-conscious. I'm like, I'm just showing somebody else's work. Um, and is there anything, you know, where, where's the validity um, and the contribution and making someone to listen to me for an hour talk about someone else's work. But I think it is this understanding of the past and that, um, we have to really reckon with that past um, kind of socially and its imprint on the built environment as we try to go forward. Um, and I think, you know, these projects really are trying to understand the past, how, you know, and are making gestures towards moving to the future. Um, I guess maybe all of our jobs is to try to continue the process of trying to understand how we can move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, L6, should I put you guys on the spot? <laughs> Hi, Sharon. Uh, Hi, Andy. And I'm Andy. Hi, B. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this lecture, mainly because it is set in South Africa, where, is, where I'm from. <laughs> Some of these locations, I was generally taken back to them as a young child. Um, and I can imagine being in some of those places. Particularly Durban. I'm pretty sure that's where we used to pick my mom up at the train station when she came back from work. <laughs> Very good. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it was really interesting to see these different initiatives and programs that are being, that were being put in, or at least being tried to cause change in those communities. It's not really something that I would have picked up on as, as a young child, but now that I've been educated, I can see what impact this can have or the wider impact this could have. The question I have is particularly related to, um, uh, where is it now? The, 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 tra the, transit, the transit interchange where mm -hmm. These structures were created, the very robust structures where um, the informal traders can rent out the space. Mm -hmm. from, from what I've experienced in the, the few informal trading settlements that I've been to is that there's this big ownership thing of if, if th this is the, um, like the trading post that I own and if you were to encroach on that, then you have a bit of a conflict. So my question is that there is the encouragement that the community owns this and this is where their activity um, you know, coalesces and happens. What does that mean in terms of like, who owns these spaces? Like who owns um, you know, you know, this, this area? It's a really good question. So um, in that particular case, in the Philippi case, um, as well as some other spaces that I didn't 
show, but we're kind of attached to that project that v, those set of VPU projects I was showing at the end, which interesting is that um, they're actually owned by, um, in the Philippi case, they're owned by the train transit authority. Um, and so the transit authority rents them out. Um, so there is kind of a, the ownership in some ways is maybe a little clearer um, in that kind of literal sense. Um, people do have to pay rent for them. I don't know, you know, how affordable the rent is. What is interesting is that over the years that I've been going to Philippi, I've seen kind of rises and falls and how much those trading bays are inhabited. Um, I think when I first started going there, they were really inhabited and then it started to really drop off, particularly as kind of the recession of the sort of 2008, 2010 hit, I think it hit everybody. Um, and there was a lot more informal traders kind of working at the periphery of the space mm -hmm. and fewer of those trading bays were actually occupied. Um, and the VPU spaces also kind of work in the same way the VPU I think it's VPU owns them and rents them out um, to traders and to entrepreneurs. But I think there's a larger question in what you're asking about who owns the space, who does it belong to? Um, and I think, you know, what the ideal is, the aspiration is that the residents of the area feel like it belongs to them, that they actually own the space, that it is for them. Um, there are people that say, that the Philippi station in general has been one of the more successful spaces because the transit authority owns it and they actually maintain it and they operate security there. And I know that the security does really work there. I actually had an interesting experience once where the security, I went there with another colleague from the University of Cape Town, so we're both white. Um, and we just kind of showed up one day and I just wanted to sort of you know, see what was going on and take some more photos. And security actually came up to us and said, are you sure you should be not sure we can make make sure you're safe here because um, you're so clearly outsiders to the space um, and we said no no we'll be fine they said okay just want you to know um, so there's there's some interesting questions about kind of who owns it who it belongs to but there's certainly an aspiration that it belongs to the residents of the space I think what would be called the community though that's also a kind of loaded term that I sometimes am hesitant to use because it sort of implies that the idea of a community is something that's really static and kind of closed, whereas actually it's much more fluid and much more diverse than sometimes we imagine. Uh, the fact that this has been even attempted um, trying to tackle what, the, what, what is such a very diverse informal um, group of people um, who are in part of the shacks or the informal settlements, I think is really appreciated in creating that safe space because I know that these are areas where crime can take over fairly quickly and it can get pretty volatile when the issue of ownership is kind of brought into that. So the, the, I, I think that it's really interesting that that is being approached with these kind of initiatives like in Philippi or the VPUU. Yeah, the, I mean the VPU is really, really interesting. VPU is much more recent. Um, maybe around 2008, I believe, VPU started, 2010. Oh, that is um, quite recent. No, it's, quite, it's quite, quite recent and it's incredibly successful. Um, and it started off as just a partnership between Kai Licha, um, which um, for everyone, uh, Kai Licha is one of the most furthest out of the peripheral uh, townships in Cape Town. I once heard a statistic that um, over 50% of people that live in Kailicha are unemployed. And if you live in Kailicha and are employed, you will use over 50% of your income paying for transit to your job. So things are really, really tough in Kailicha um, and the violence is really horrific. And so VPU started off as a partnership between Kailicha, the city and the German Development Bank. And it's been so successful that it's spread now to communities and neighborhoods across Cape Town. Um, so it's considered a really successful model. Um, and I think it is because it's worked maybe in some ways because they work so closely in partnership with residents and everything is sort of done um, in a very participatory way. I wouldn't know this, I go as far as to say completely consensus based, but participatory. So again, ownership, the community, the residents take ownership over the space. Um, 
yeah, which makes it a very interesting process. Amazing, thank you. Uh, I have no further questions. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I'm Robin. Um, I'm originally from South Africa as well. Um, I grew up there for the first 19 years of my life, um, predominantly in the northern suburbs in Johannesburg. And my goal is to learn more about um, post-apartheid architecture. And uh, what really stood out to me is the lighthouses. Um, obviously, Cape Town is, um, you know, geographically, you've got the um, Indian Ocean and Atlantic Ocean meeting, and there's quite a rocky coastline, and that they've taken that kind of idea to make a lighthouse in space that people can actually use and not just um, one for ships but for actual people and I wanted to find out a bit more about that as a community space or an anti-rape space or an anti-violence space how do they use that as a positive means not just a safe haven or refuge for um, gender-based violence which is highly prevalent in South Africa um, yes, so in part of um, these sort of light boxes, try to prevent um, exactly what you're talking about, uh, sort of gender-based violence, um, as well as other types of personal violence, um, because so much of that violence is seen to happen in public space, particularly as people are journeying from one space to another. And part of that is because of the actual sort of topography, not of the land necessarily, but the topography of the built environment that um, public spaces are so few um, and the environment, um, when you kind of look across the horizon in a township, it's sort of this constant kind of low level, sort of single level dwelling. And there's no, there's no icons, there's no spaces which, where the landscape sort of pops up. There's no sense of destination. There's no sense of a public space where you're sort of seen and being seen. So the, ch the opportunities for violence are much greater. Um, of course, you know, the violence occurs also because of social stresses. So there's sort of, you know, the chicken and egg kind of problem that's being uh, addressed. But um, so in part, what these light boxes are for is to kind of facilitate that, to sort of ensure that the violence is much less likely to happen. But then what happens inside the light boxes are the activities that actually try to address the sort of root causes of poverty and kind of social ills in the area. So there are meeting spaces, there are spaces, I believe, for counselors, there are spaces for economic activity. So that one light box um, building that I showed had some spaces to sort of sell goods out of. Um, so different types of community resources. And I'm sorry, I don't know exactly specific ones and specific buildings. I have to say VPU is um, a project that I know less well than the Dignified Places program, um, just because of the research I've done. But there are different types of community activities that are happening inside those buildings. But then there's um, what's interesting about the BPU is it really is this kind of string of interventions. And so in, um, in that space, there's the public path, there's a light box, and then there's a street, and then there's another set of spaces. That was where I was showing the library um, and that pay center. And next to those is another building um, that has spaces for um, entrepreneurs like fashion designers and different kinds of craft incubators and small business incubators to actually set up um, shop because there's an idea that if there's more economic opportunities so so much of the sort of violence really comes from the lack of economic opportunity which is such a legacy of apartheid so by trying to create opportunities for the economic um, activities as well as funding for those um, that hopefully can in a kind of longer term way address the violence. Thank you so much. That really helps me to understand something because obviously if you're born in 1988 
your very young child when the transition from apartheid into the Rainbow Nation is taking place. And I'm Absolutely. really grateful to you for your work because it's, um, yeah, it takes great guts to look at something that's so terrifying but also trying to find solutions. So thank you very much, Dr. Toma. And thank you, B, for letting me be a part of the lift. You're welcome. Wonderful. Uh, we have a note um, on the chat. That's It's from Rebecca. And she says, it must have been really poignant when the Firewalker statue was built, even though it was during a time when women uh, and workers like uh, the Firewalker were being pushed out of the town. Yeah, it was. So, I mean, um, and this is, again, a project that I'm not at all an expert in, but I find really an intriguing um, kind of analytical entry into some questions. Um, but yes, I mean, it was, it was part of the reason that um, kind of I know a bit about it is because a whole book was written about the sculpture. Um, and I know um, M. Poe, who I um, was referring to her work, I know her a tiny bit. So um, I was uh, kind of grabbed my attention to get the book and to start looking at it. But the fact that this sculpture has a whole book about it really says a lot. It was a really, really big moment. I mean, just as I said, it's a big deal for governments to actually acknowledge informal activities and be designing spaces to accommodate those informal activities, a huge public sculpture to kind of commemorate and celebrate the sort of the figure of the Black African woman performing sort of the labor that's needed to support herself. That in some ways is great. You know, that's really, really important. So um, but then, you know, the question, the cr critical question that gets asked is, are we celebrating her as a way of kind of branding the city and kind of almost using the sculpture to help push her out of the city? Um, even if that wasn't necessarily the intent, that's unfortunately sometimes the result of these upgrading activities. And this is, you know, a bigger set of questions about um, particularly the use of art and cultural activities in gentrification. And I know that, you know, it's a tiny bit of work that I've done, but in England, you have this situation as well. Absolutely. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Um, I, I know we're, we're, we're coming into um, 7.30 here, so uh, half the hour, and I know you, you, you need to take your students back to class, but I, I think I, I, I personally, uh, well, I, I found that the, the lecture was, was so so exciting uh it, within all its issues that are so uh uh troubling uh uh you know it's not just now it it seems to be an ongoing uh issue that our society and societies just just go through uh, uh and continue to you know in some ways trying to 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 fix or remedy uh uh, uh such issues that were created uh um nonetheless. So I, I think I, I would like to, to push this into, you know, the architecture. So, so the, the, the profession of architecture and how architecture uh, uh, becomes a driver that stitches or, or uh, somehow, and I'm, I'm going to use, this is not my term, this is Alejandro Aravena's uh, uh, famous <laughs> quote that says that architecture is like a shortcut uh, uh, to equality. Uh, um, so so I, I, I think two things that really uh, are, are striking and, and important is that the participation of the population. Uh, uh, it, it's not someone that just comes in, you know, an architect and, and designs what thinks the space should be uh, uh, looking like, you know, and, you know, we're, we're not even um, um, hinting on identity or nationalism or, 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 or style or anything like that, but the, the participation of the population. I'm, I'm interested to know how deep that participation is, if it's on a, on a design level. And, and continuing with this idea of Alejandro Aravena, because he's, he's doing something kind of a similar uh, in Chile, where he talk, you know, it's kind of a, develops this incremental style of architecture that, you know, you go halfway and then the rest, it actually 
uh, 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 is developed and, and, and grows out of out of sort of kind of the 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 effort of the population that inhabits the space. So, so on a design level, um, is there a, a, a deep uh, contribution uh, from the population? And now we're, we're speaking on a, on, a, on a design level. So apart from, from, from all the, the necessities and trying to respond to, to, to the space, on a design level, uh, what is the sort of kind of a contribution uh, uh, that population, depending on the neighborhood or, or the area, really have a say on it? I understand that, you know, painting, it seems to be an aftermath uh, design sort of kind of a, a contribution? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, it's really varies from really from architect to architect and program to program. Um, the Dignified Places program, one of the critiques of it has been or was when it was sort of running was a lack of really meaningful community participation in the design. So the architects talked about kind of slipping onto the site um, at the Philippi Public Transit Interchange and kind of observing what was going on. They mapped um, how people were using the space and they held public meetings um, with users of the space, but I'm not sure how much they got involved in actual design questions. I'm not sure how participatory it was. I think that at, um, and the VPU is much more participatory. The, um, there's a lot deeper engagement, uh, though in the end it is still um, architect driven in terms of the design of the buildings, but in terms of kind of what people want, what they're looking for, what they need, it's much more participatory. There are some architects, so there's, a, there's kind of a body of architects, at least in Cape Town, and Cape Town's the only city that I know well as a community. Um, kind of a community of practice. So there's a body of architects who are very interested in work that is trying to deal with the legacy of apartheid, whether that's, you know, certain spaces or certain populations that are, were devastated by it. And some of those architects work in very participatory manners and some don't at all. Some sort mm -hmm. of believe in kind of a more benevolent, sort of a benevolent dictator sort of approach that, you know, <laughs> working with residents to sort of understand what the overall needs are, but the design comes from the architect, does not come from I know. Uh, yeah. the residents. But there's other architects, I know one architect, Karen Smuts, um, whose uh, office is CS Studio, only will work in a participatory manner. Um, and she tells these great stories of one project that she was working on a meat market um, with a group of women and she designed something and they said, no, no, that's completely ridiculous and all wrong. And they sort of said, this is what we need. And they kind of redesigned it with mm. her in space. Um, so yeah, so there's, it varies, I would say. It's interesting, the Arvena approach and the kind of this sort of incremental approach, because I do see it happening in South Africa as well. There's actually, um, actually one of these architects who is sort of the benevolent dictator, <laughs> Joe Nuero, um, and I think Joe would use that term to, to um, represent himself, though maybe not dictator, but something similar. Um, he's the, he did a project, I think that it's earlier than any of the Aravena projects that I know of, that's really the same thing, it's a half house. Um, sort of approach where they built kind of this narrow house and then left the space and the infrastructure for the residents to then continue it on. And with the same sort of questions that really the most expensive thing is the infrastructure, electricity, plumbing, you provide that and some sort of structure and that you let the residents take over. Um, so it's actually an approach that's um, been used quite a bit in South Africa as well. Does that answer the question? Very interesting. Um, no. It's also interesting that we're having uh, very similar questions uh, uh, in Europe at the moment with, you know, the death of the, the, the street and, and I, I don't even want to actually make the connection to COVID now and how those, those public areas are actually uh, uh, coping with, you know, the, the distancing that, that is necessary. Uh, uh, within this 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 virus, I think we have to to leave that for 
<laughs> another um, wonderful talk from you. Uh, but it's, I, 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 I will um, comment this on, on with my students because we, we have taken a section, uh, uh, a street, and that's our site. Uh, 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 and that cross section, you know, does cut through different sort of kind of a strata, social strata in Birmingham. And I, I, I can see the connection of, you know, uh, uh, how the death, it's, it's I, I find it very interesting, uh, the contribution and, and the participation of, of, of the resident uh, 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 into uh, re-energizing the, 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 the urban space. Um, Sharon, um, I, fantastic. Uh, um, I'm absolutely speechless. It's, it's, it's fantastic. So, so uh, um, provocative uh, uh, conversation that, you know, we would just need some, some tea or coffee to, to continue. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for taking time of your, you know, and, 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 exciting news, you know, and actually, you know, opening all these questions that are so important in our profession, uh, uh, and, and especially uh, all the social matters that, that ignites that we, we have to be thinking of uh, as architects and future architects uh, um, attending this meeting. Um, thank you. Um, thank you all for zooming in. Um, for my students, it's now time to go back to your interim review and get ready for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, uh, and Sharon students should be heading back to, to class. Um, yes. we'll, we'll, st we'll start our Zoom in just a minute. <laughs> um, Sharon, thank you so, so much. Um, it was really wonderful. Um, it's really good to even ECU, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Great to hear your voice. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aaron. Okay. Take care. Keep, keep safe. You too, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye.